Our Story Productions presents On the Road to Our Story, featuring a variety of programs that take a closer look at the organizations, businesses, and people located in the small communities of the Midwest. So get ready, for you're about to travel On the Road to Our Story. Hello, I'm Jason Howland. Welcome to Speaking of Health, a place to help you learn how to live a longer and healthier life. Fall and winter is flu season. It's something you and your family should be thinking about. Every year, thousands of Americans die from seasonal influenza or flu-related complications. Our guest today is Dr. Jeff Green. He is a family physician at Mayo Clinic Health System. Dr. Green, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate you having me here today. Well, uh, let's start out by defining what exactly is influenza, and is it the same thing as stomach flu? Right, so when patients come into the office to be seen and they say they have the flu, we often have to query them as to what they mean by that. So influenza is also known as the respiratory flu, and by definition then it attacks the respiratory tree, which starts uh, at the tip of our nose and our lips and heads down into uh, our, our back of our throat and our trachea and into our lungs. And so the respiratory flu is what we mean when we're talking about influenza. The stomach flu, on the other hand, uh, we often term it gastroenteritis. It too is caused by viruses, nasty ones, which tend to hang out on cruise ships and tend to cause stomach symptoms. So uh, we're nauseated or we'll throw up, we'll run a temperature, we'll have some cramps and some bloating and not feel well. And so today's discussion centers on the flu, but more specifically uh, influenza or the respiratory flu. So what are the symptoms of uh, respiratory influenza. So respiratory flu, uh, when we're exposed, it usually takes a, a couple of days, on average about two days to develop symptoms. Uh, it can be as soon as a day after exposure and as long as four days. It tends to come on somewhat abruptly. Uh, symptoms sometimes will mimic a cold. We might have some cough, uh, a little congestion, uh, but as respiratory flu progresses, we tend to develop uh, fever, though not always, uh, but often. Uh, have some chills. We might feel hot and sweaty, alternatively cold and freezing. Um, we'll develop some nasal congestion, a sore throat, uh, body aches, uh, generalized malaise or not feeling well, as well as some weakness and some fatigue, feeling like we're kind of wiped out, if you will. So really, uh, the symptoms often start out seeming like the common cold, but they then get much more severe than a cold. Exactly. And so we develop those upper respiratory tract infection kind of symptoms, uh, and then they tend to hit us uh, a little harder uh, than the typical regular winter cold kind of stuff. And unlike the cold, uh, flu tends to hang around? Yes, yeah, so symptoms uh, can last, you know, four, five, six, uh, seven days, uh, usually peak uh, day three or four. Uh, um, and then we, as we take care of ourselves, we feel better day by day and can kind of get back to our usual selves after about a week or so. So what causes people to catch the flu? And the respiratory flu is spread by uh, droplets. And these droplets are produced when we talk, uh, when we sneeze, when we cough, when we uh, also our secretions uh, contain viruses when we wipe our nose or, or um, wipe our, our chin or our mouth or these types of things. Most commonly respiratory flu is sped by droplet which is aerosolized when we do these things that we just talked about. Um, it can, not as common, but can uh, be transmitted with secretions on various objects and such. So how serious can influenza be? Can it be fatal? Yeah, unfortunately, it, it, it seems every flu year uh, on the national news networks, we hear about some very tragic cases of influenza-related de deaths. Uh, um, it can be very serious. Um, it can also be easily prevented in many cases, and so we'll talk a little bit later in the show about uh, vaccinations. It can be very, very serious. What happens is, is we come down with influenza, and if we're typically young and healthy and have a vigorous and a robust uh, immune system, we, we tend to fight it off, and, and yeah, again, after a week or so, we're, we're back to our usual selves. If we're immunocompromised, so the very young, or as we age, our immune system isn't quite what it was, 
um, we can develop uh, a more severe case of the flu or subsequently secondary infections uh, as our body's normal immune system and uh, means of fighting off disease uh, are weakened by influenza virus, uh, then we can come down with some of the complications, the most severe of which is pneumonia, uh, which can lead to respiratory failure, which can lead to uh, death uh, when not treated aggressively. Who's at mo most risk for developing influenza? All of us uh, are at risk for coming in contact with people that are shedding influenza virus. So uh, whether we're at, uh, at home, someone comes home from school or daycare or at work or we're a healthcare professional or we interact with the public on a regular basis, those respiratory droplets can be and are everywhere and so all of us can come down with it. Those that are at highest risk uh, for complications are again, the real young. So folks, uh, young kids, uh, younger than the age of five, particularly younger than the age of two, tend to have more severe complications. Uh, elderly folks uh, over the age of 65 uh, tend to have a harder time uh, with uh, influenza-related illness. Uh, pregnant women uh, also uh, tend to be uh, or can be more severely affected. And those with chronic medical conditions. So uh, folks with uh, COPD, which includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis, uh, folks that have asthma, folks with underlying heart conditions, um, diabetes, um, folks who are immunosuppressed, so some of our friends or family members or community members who may be undergoing chemotherapy, being treated for cancer, which uh, those treatments uh, which suppress the immune system are all at uh, high risk for developing severe flu. So if I'm experiencing flu symptoms, when should I go see my healthcare provider like yourself? And then how do you treat the flu? Uh, flu season uh, typically uh, peaks uh, January and February. We, certainly we start to hear cases uh, in, in late fall. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Health and, and our good uh, resources on the radio and the TV usually uh, keep us uh, in the loop as to when flu season is arriving. Uh, and so if we start to develop symptoms of cough and cold and congestion, uh, some of those common sense uh, measures of staying home from work, using some Tylenol or ibuprofen or Aleve is appropriate, provided those are safe in our individual situations, uh, to treat some of the uh, symptoms is, is quite reasonable, staying hydrated or resting, as I mentioned. Uh, if symptoms continue to persist or we start to develop those more severe symptoms, which we reference, so, you know, an elevated temperature, um, muscle ache, uh, hot and cold sweats, and particularly if we're one of those high, in one of those high-risk candidates that we referenced earlier, seeing a physician or a provider is important uh, to diagnose flu uh, early enough so that we can potentially treat it. When a person comes into the clinic, uh, oftentimes we can make a diagnosis by history. Uh, oftentimes we may use some additional testing measures. If, if symptoms and history uh, confirm, uh, as well as testing uh, can confirm influenza, then treatment is an option. And so there are some various treatments uh, that we can implement to treat flu. Uh, these are antiviral medications. One's a medicine by mouth, the other's an inhaled medicine. And these tend to uh, limit the severity of the uh, illness as well as to shorten the duration of symptoms. We should make it clear too that those medications, they don't prevent you from getting the flu, they simply treat the symptoms and the actual virus. Exactly, these uh, medicines are used to treat uh, folks who have influenza. At the same time, if I have a confirmed case of influenza and I have close contacts within my family and I want to keep them from getting the flu, then we can prophylax family members uh, by having them take a similar medicine, it's a little different dose and for a different period of time, to decrease the likelihood of transmission within those close household contacts. So this brings us to the number one question. How do we prevent the flu? Influenza vaccination is recommended for every individual over the age of six months. Uh, and so the CDC uh, used to, in the past, uh, try to qualify who's at the highest risk and let's make sure we immunize them. And, and what we've um, decided upon is a strategy of essentially universal immunization. Uh, and so immunization plays a, a key role in obvious uh, prevention. And so 
We've tried to uh, make it easy for patients to be able to get their flu shot. So even the pharmacies uh, are uh, able to provide uh, influenza vaccines. We also have some outreach programs to some of the larger employees in town where we can go out and immunize uh, patients. So, uh, so prevention uh, certainly is, is, is key. We've also tried to make it easy on patients uh, who may have some issues with needles. Uh, some folks don't like shots. Uh, not too many people enjoy shots. Uh, and so there's a lot of different ways to get the uh, flu vaccine. There's an intradermal injection, which just goes into the super uh, or the to, into the skin. There's the intramuscular injection, which goes a little bit deeper. There's actually a, a jet propulsion air injector, uh, which has just been uh, made available. And then there's also for the appropriate uh, patient um, demographics, an inhaled vaccine, which is actually the preferred vaccine for uh, pediatric patients between the ages of two and eight. And, and what exactly is the vaccine? Is it the, are, are you giving them a, a small amount of the flu virus? Yes, and so the scientists, uh, the epidemiologists and the virologists, the smart people who are, uh, who are charged with tracking um, influenza cases around the world, they come up with a recipe, if you will, of, of the uh, main characters for active influenza um, disease for that given year. Uh, and then the vaccine makers, uh, they essentially chop up pieces of those uh, viruses uh, and then we administer them and then our body recognizes them as foreign and as, as viruses. And our immune system then goes to work in, in creating an antibody response. Um, and so the injectable uh, vaccines are killed viruses. And we'll talk a little bit of later about how we can't get the flu uh, from the flu shot. Um, the attenuated viruses, or, or one of the inhaled forms, is a weakened virus. It's weakened so much that it cannot cause the, the flu. Um, but then um, those tissues, which are kind of the first line uh, defenses against uh, influenza, become exposed to particles of virus so that when the exposure happens out in our community activities, our body can jump on it right away and mount an immune response. So besides the flu vaccine, what are some other ways to prevent the flu? Just a common lifestyle things. Right, so all those things that, uh, that our, our moms uh, told us when we were young. In fact, my wife, when, when I came in to, to, to film this, said, don't, whatever you do, don't pick your nose. And so, <laughs> so picking your nose is not a good thing. Uh, staying away from our eyes and our nose and our mouth during flu season is a, is a good idea. Washing our hands regularly, using simple soap and water, uh, some of the uh, neat, uh, easy, accessible alcohol-based hand cleaners, uh, covering our coughs. So when we've got, whether it be the cold or, or one of the other viruses or the influenza virus, uh, trying to decrease the means by which we transmit that to other people, the old hacking into our, our elbow, staying home from work when we're sick. Um, these types of things can hopefully uh, decrease the number of folks that come in contact uh, with influenza virus. You mentioned the covering your cough and your sleeve. Now, obviously, you don't want to be covering your cough with your hands, which a lot of people probably do. Right. So anything that we can do to kind of keep these respiratory droplets uh, from being aerosolized is kind of key. Mythbusters actually, I think you can probably Google it. Uh, they, they looked at all different ways, hands, uh, handkerchiefs, and putting your hand into your elbow and coughing that had the, uh, the least amount of aerosolization. Uh, so that's the preferred method. All right, so let's go back to the flu shot now. What about people who think that they might actually catch the flu by getting the flu shot? Right, as we discussed, uh, the, the particles in the flu vaccine are incapable of producing uh, respiratory influenza. At the same time, sometimes people will have a local reaction or sometimes a generalized reaction um, to the constituents of the vaccine. It takes two weeks to develop antibodies, so sometimes we may have developed a cough or a cold or even come down with influenza when we're still susceptible uh, to, the, to the virus. Um, sometimes we're not very good at matching uh, the strains. And so we get a flu shot and then over time the uh, virus has changed uh, and so uh, the immunity isn't quite what we had expected. 
So uh, just to be clear, you cannot get the flu by taking a flu shot. That is, that is true. We cannot get influenza by taking the flu immunization in any of its forms. Well, unfortunately, we're all out of time, but I'd like to thank our guest today, Dr. Jeff Green, Mayo Clinic Health System family physician, for joining us today on Speaking of Health, a great topic. Thank you very great. much. Thanks for having me. Have a great day, everyone, and be healthy. You're in for a treat now, folks. It's time to look back at one of our favorite episodes of the Cocklebur Morning Show. Our Story Productions presents the Cocklebur Morning Show, where we weed out the big stories from throughout Sweet Swan County with Bobby Ray and Sally Sue. Oh, thank you, thank you, and welcome to our show today. And what a fantastic show we have. Yes, we do. And we have to welcome you back. Thank you, Sally Sue. I oh, appreciate that very much. we missed you so much. Yep. Where were you for two whole weeks? No explanation. Mm. You just made that call. Well, the situation was this, Sally Sue. Okay. I have become, let's just say, really good friends with Clarice Plow from Hidden Away, Not Forgotten. Clarice Plow. Mm -hmm. Didn't she write that book? Oh, yeah. About the yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, women of Sweet Swine County? Yeah, it's entitled Not So Sweet, a real page turner, let me tell you. It's kind of a tell all. Anyway, right? Clarice, oh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Anyway, Clarice asked if I would help uh, with the book tour. Oh, really? Yes. So I, you know, I tagged along and I thought I could pick up some historical sites uh -huh. along the way as uh -huh. well. And, um, and, and also, you know, be able to find out some more about those people that we could use against, I mean, <laughs> just some more research. Yeah, research is always good, but oh, mm -hmm. um, Bobby Ray, honestly, two weeks, two whole weeks. Well, I thought that I'd be back by showtime, uh -huh. but, you know, to get that kind of information, I had to wine and I had to dine. I spent my entire expense account on oh, Clarice. Your whole expense? The whole thing. I spent wow. every dime. I spent wow. so much money, I had to walk back to oh Sweet Swine County. I did a <laughs> well, you must have done something really good because we got something. I have a note. What did we get? We got a present. It we, says Bobby did? Ray and Sally Sue. Just a little present for promoting the book Clar Clarice wrote, Love the Women of Sweet Swine County. And I'm sure the hugs and kisses are for you. But, okay. But, what did we get? Close your eyes. Okay. <laughs> What do you think? Oh. I, I, I'm thinking the note is sweeter than the gift. They must be confused. I'm Those thinking. poor girls, it's not the cockle bird no, morning no, show. No, no, no. It's the cockle bird morning show. You know, but you know, they're a, they're a little bit behind the curve. And the elevator doesn't go to the top yeah. floor, but that's okay. And if you, know, if you read the book, there's well, let me a lot tell you. there let that me has tell you. problems Oh, let me tell and you. Issues. And I got some scoop right now. Why don't we invite our guest out today? <gasps> yes. I'm telling you, I'm excited about this. I am too. I oh. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, our guest today is well known on national TV, has been on various talk shows. We are so pleased and proud to have with us today Martin County's own Tron guy, Jay Maynard. Oh, Welcome, yes. Jay. Welcome. Welcome. Jay, to our mm -hmm. show. It's a delight to have you here. Well, I'm happy to be here. Jay, it is a pleasure to have you here, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. Where in the heck did you get that suit? <laughs> I had it custom made. Really? Um, the, uh, the, the, the characters in the movie Tron, if you right, look, right. Uh, their, their bodies are all green. And, and the po folks who, uh, other folks who made costumes like this, they tended to make them out of white, and I felt that was kind of you know, kind of wimping out on it. Mm -hmm. So I actually went to Fleet and picked this color huh. of paint and painted up the identity disc here identity disc. and sent it off to a lady who I dealt with before and had her make the unitard custom to my size and, cus wow. and match the color. Wow. That, is, that so, is very unique. So what did you use 
I mean, there's there's soft this pieces, is, hard pieces. Yes, what did you it, use it, to make the, it? The soft pieces are all cotton spandex. Okay. Uh, it's actually one one piece covers the entire body. Oh, really? Um, this is the same kind of hockey helmet that they actually used oh. in the movie. Um, and that's and an actual hockey That's helmet. an actual Cooper hockey helmet. Wow, yes, and identity you have all the wires? Identity disc. That's the identity disc. Genuine, Look at that. genuine wow. whammo. Uh, <laughs> this is... This is, this is form PVC, and that's a football shoulder guard. Uh, oh, really? Wow. Well, I'm, wow. You know, Amazing. And I understand, because I've watched a couple of your national oh, broadcast yes. programs. Impressive. All very much so. Yes. And I, and I want to know how the web helped you. But before you answer that, I think I'd like to give our viewers a treat. And let's see what Tron Guy looks like. <gasps> Lit up, lights off. <gasps> Louie, oh. hit the lights. Oh. I loved it. Wow. So now, as I was asking you now, how did the web help this all take off for you? Uh, without the web, it wouldn't have happened at all. Okay. Wow. As I was making the costume, I was getting help from a lady in New York City. Really? really? So getting from here to New York City wow. is not something you just jump in your car and drive across town <laughs> no. to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I took pictures as I was going along and, and put them together for a web page for her so she could see the progress and give me hints. When it was done, I said, okay, fine. Maybe other folks would like to make a costume like this. So I put the page up on the web for everybody to look at. And it became one of those pages that everybody emailed all their friends. Hey, you got to go check out this web page. And so and without the web, right. it wouldn't have happened at all. That's amazing. Now, in part of what I, I watched, you were at a convention, a computer convention, an electronics convention. It's, Why don't you explain that to um, us? It's, the, it's actually a combination science fiction and computing convention. Okay. Uh, it, ter it turns out that the kind of people who go to, to, go to either of those, there's a lot of overlap. Mm. Somebody notices, hey, let's, let's make one that does both. And that was the first, one, first science fiction convention I've ever been to. So I, I went to that, saw a masquerade, thought, hey, you know, it'd be interesting to try to make a costume. And being a combination science fiction and computer convention, I thought Tron, being a movie, a science fiction movie mm -hmm. about computing, would sure. be a subject to draw from. Well, that's interesting. brilliant. Interesting. Wonderful. So when you're not Tron guy, what do you do in the <laughs> real world? How do you know he doesn't do anything else except Tron guy? <laughs> no. I, How big did you I, I, I wish I could make a living off of this, but uh, no. Um, Big surprise, I'm a computer consultant. Oh, oh so that, I'm hello. shocked. Yes, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do computers for a living. That oh, makes okay. Sense. Neat. That makes sense. So did you dress up a lot when you were a little kid? No, not really. Really? Um, no. I really didn't do anything in the way of costuming, with one exception, uh, until this happened. The one uh -huh. exception being Renaissance fairs. Oh, uh, yeah. I'd go to those in yeah. garden. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, oh. the, the lady I bought the unitard from was the lady who I bought my tights for my Renaissance clothing from. I understand. Oh, now, that lady okay. that you bought your unitard from, is she from New York? Is that the lady you're speaking no, of? No, okay. uh, uh, she was in Indiana. Really? And that, yeah, that's where oh. she was. So the, the lady in New York is, yes. a, is, a, is a good friend who I'd met sometime okay. before. And she, okay. she helped me with things like paint and okay. you know, the, the techniques of doing it. Gave you some technical right. ideas. Now, when you were at that convention... Did, I'll bet you got a lot of a lot of looks, didn't you? Well, I did. I kept it very closely under wraps until the time of the contest. It was a masquerade costume contest, <clears throat> and the reason I did that is that I, one of the judges at, of that contest was a friend. Okay. Oh, okay. So I I wanted to avoid trading on that sure. friendship. Mm -hmm. So I kept it very closely held until it came time for everybody to get together to. Uh, to to have the costumes inspected before the actual uh, presentation, right. and I I was standing around in the hall just outside the room where we were meeting, and it turns out that that she was the first one to walk up and see me, <laughs> and she took one look at me and said, "Wow," and that was the reaction pretty much the entire weekend. Awesome. That's great. How many people were there approximately? About five hundred. Wow. And when I made the costume, I expected maybe five hundred people would ever see it. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Go around the world how many times? Oh, uh, yeah, yes. it's, um, it, it's gone well beyond anything that I had ever imagined. So what other TV shows have you appeared on? I mentioned a couple of national mm -hmm. ones. I was just I, uh, I was on Jimmy Kimmel Live a bunch right. the year that this happened. Really? Um, and what so, year was that, Jay? That was 2004. 2004. So wow. Five okay. and a half years ago now. Okay. 
it seems like a lifetime. Uh, but I've also been uh, been parody on the South Park, and they uh, and, and I had no idea that was coming. They didn't. They didn't ask me. They didn't tell me. I, the first I knew about it was when this same lady in New York uh, sends me an instant message on the computer. And says, "Turn on Comedy Central now," and we did. And there I was. Um, the, my only complaint about that segment is that they got the voice wrong. <laughs> I, li, I mean, listen to me. Do I sound like I'm from Minnesota? Yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Say something sorry. with an O in it. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah pretty yeah. much. I'm pretty sorry. much. I'm. Well, see, I'm from Houston originally. You've got oh, a little see? southern twang. I thought uh -huh. I heard that. Okay. <laughs> and so they made me sound like I like I was from Minnesota, don't you know? Oh, they oh. get the. You betcha. Uh, yeah, sure. Eh? Not quite, but it, but it made it. You could hear it in there. Okay. Uh, so the voice was wrong. Other than that, you know, it it wasn't bad. That's great. That's um, and I've been on Tech TV G4 a few times, and most recently on Tosh.0 on Comedy Central. Oh, really? That was just a month ago. That's oh, great. And yeah. what was on, that was on what program on Comedy Central? It was Tosh.0. Tosh.0. Tosh. Tosh. Okay. Oh. I've not watched that one yet. I haven't either. Nope. No. Um, so, now, with all this national acclaim, how has that certainly has changed your life a little Oy. bit? How has that? I refer to it as when my life got turned upside down. Really? Um, the, the, the convention was the weekend of tax day 2004. Okay. And in the run up to that, you know, I'm just uh, your average computer consultant and, and toiling anonymously in Fairmont. And then the next week, every, it seemed like every radio station was calling me asking for an interview. And I, was, I did a lot of those. The folks from Kimmel called. Um, and it's for a guy who's never had any of that kind of exposure. It's really something to get off of an airplane and suddenly turn into somebody important. They had, <laughs> you know, chauffeured limo at the airport, take put me up in wow. a nice hotel just down the street from the studio, wow. the whole nine yards. That's great. That's that wonderful. Had to be. And now you've been there how many times? Uh, the total is now sixteen. Impressive. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Yes. And I had a lot of fun doing that. I can imagine. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, right in Fairmont. Martin County? Right next door. In Sweet Spine County, yep. yes. Amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, Jay, what are your future plans for Tron Guy? Generally, what I've found is that people who promote themselves on the Internet get shot down in flames. Uh, the Internet is probably the best detector there is of, oh, let's say pig exhaust. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Yes. <laughs> That's so, good. I'll, I'll take, I take it as it comes. Well, I'll tell you what, I just have one favor before we have you leave. Mm-hmm. Do us both a favor mm -hmm. and do not appear on the show Women of Sweet yes. Swine County. You cannot go there. That, I mean, okay. we, we really worked hard to get you here, so uh, we prefer that you not be on the Women of Sweet Oh, Swine. Okay. okay. Competition. Yes. Yeah. Uh, kind of. Just a little. Just a little. Okay. Thank you, Jay, for Thank coming today. Yes. It was a delight having you. You're certainly welcome. Thank you to our citizens for their reports mm -hmm. and to you, our viewers, for Absolutely. watching the Cockerbird Morning Show, where we read out the big stories throughout Sweet Swine County. Bye-bye for now. Bye, y'all. Hi, I'm Charles Cornrault, and you probably know me from the TV show Tuesday Afternoon. Well, enough about me. Join my fellow celebrities as we take a look at small town living at its best. In the county of Martin, the town of Fairmont, Minnesota, you will find our story productions. In 2007, Jeff and Denise Rouse had a goal to produce a television program that would highlight the businesses, organizations, events, and people of their community. After hiring a local production company and recruiting friends and community members to volunteer, they began one of the most unique programs on TV. Because of their unique and, dare we say, corny programming, the show gained popularity. With their popularity, other communities began to contact them to see if they could become part of the Our Story family. New programs were added, additional volunteers were recruited, the Our Story team discovered some of the best stories were coming out of some of the smallest towns. So the decision was made to feature as many of the small towns as possible, no matter how small. They believe that every town has a story, and they all need to be told. 
Today, with staff that included over 60 volunteers, the television show Our Story, Small Town Living at Its Best, spotlights over 225 small communities in four states and has told over 1,500 stories about the communities in the upper Midwest. Each show is aired in over 1 million households on cable television, as well as on their website, YouTube, and Facebook, and yes, even Pinterest. Our Story Productions continues to receive requests to join Our Story family and welcomes communities to email them to have their businesses, organizations, events, or people featured. Our Story Productions is proud to be sharing the lifestyle that we share in the small towns of the Upper Midwest, for it's not just the past, but the present that becomes Our Story.